Hey there, it's Debbie, and welcome to Playback Friday. Most Fridays, I re release one of my favorite conversations from the archive. So, unless you're a longtime listener of the show, there's a good chance you haven't heard this one yet. And even if you have, you just might get something completely different from it listening to it this time around. First of all, parents are less likely to even want to get a diagnosis in the first place because it's like, that's too scary. What if I don't even want to hear that information? And then they can't reach out for support because they feel like somebody will judge them. And they can't find the other people who are, you know, facing this struggle. I remember the week after the Canadian edition of my book coming out, I got tons of Facebook messages from people in my own life who said, oh, yeah, we were dealing with that, too. And I was just like smacking my forehead thinking, why were we all in silos thinking it was just our family? Welcome to the Tilt Parenting Podcast, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. I'm your host, Debbie Reber, and today's episode features a conversation with Anne Douglas, author of the book, Parenting Through the Storm, Find Help, Hope, and Strength When Your Child Has Psychological Problems. As you'll hear from our conversation, Anne has a lot of experience in the world of differently wired children as she's raised four of her own while also being differently wired herself. In addition to wanting to give parents tools they can use to make their lives easier, Anne is passionate about changing the experience for differently wired people, especially when it comes to recognizing and combating the many negative stigmas that exist. I wanted to talk with Anne about what labels and stigmas do to our kids, when to talk to our kids about their diagnoses, and find out what she's learned through parenting her own unique kids. I found our conversation super interesting. I hope you do too. Thanks for listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. To learn more about Tilt, visit www.tiltparenting.com. Hello, everyone. It's Debbie Reber with the Tilt Parenting Podcast. And today I am happy to be speaking with author, content creator, speaker, and mentor, Anne Douglas. So welcome to the show, Anne. Oh, I'm so happy to be here, Debbie. Well, we are happy to have you here. And you and I had talked prior to recording this podcast, and I think we realized there were so many different topics we could talk about, (laughs) Um, but we decided to focus this episode on the theme of stigma, and specifically the negative stigmas that are attached to many ways of being differently wired. Before we get into that, though, I would love if you could just take a few minutes to tell us about your own journey of raising not one, not two, not three, but four... (laughs) impressive for differently wired kids. So could you tell us a little bit about your kids and what your path was like and and also just how they're doing now? For sure. Yeah. Um, It's funny when I think back to the time that when things were sort of really, really difficult, this was around 2003. I remember thinking at that time, how are we going to get through this? Like I was feeling overwhelmed. The kids are feeling overwhelmed. It was just a really, really difficult place to be. So I just think it's really important for people to know that if you're feeling that way, things can get so much better, much better than you would ever, ever think possible when things are really bad. Mm. So just to give a snapshot of what was going on at that time, uh, this was, like I say, around 2003, and my daughter Julie was in grade 10, and she was going through a really dark and angry phase. Just a couple of years earlier, she had overdosed on extra strength Tylenol, came dangerously close to taking her life. And so we, as her parents, were petrified, were off balance, and she was just really struggling. I mean, um, I sort of feel like if there was any kind of like after school special TV kind of topic that was ever done, I think Julie lived it during that time Mm. period. So it was just a really hard time for all of us. And then at the same time, she also had an eating disorder. She was dabbling in drugs, like everything was going on. And then Scott, who is a year and a half younger than her, he was going through a hard time with ADHD. And at that point, there was not a lot of understanding or acceptance. There was an awful lot of judgment against kids who had ADHD. And so he was running into trouble in school with his relationships, uh, not wanting to do his schoolwork. It was just a really bad situation. And then a year and a half younger than him is Eric. And at that point, we didn't really know exactly what was going on with Eric. We were just starting to find out. He would later be diagnosed with a learning difference, which basically made it hard for him to 
communicate in writing. He was understanding everything beautifully, but when it came time to put words on a page, he didn't understand punctuation, he didn't understand sentence structure, and he was having a really hard time. And because he was feeling so frustrated, he was acting out in school. And I remember at one point we were called to the school for a meeting, and they suggested that they put him on a modified schedule. And I said, well, that's very interesting. What's a modified schedule? And they said, well, he'd be allowed to go to school for half an hour a day. Well, you don't have to know how the rest of that conversation went. I bet you can all guess. So it was quite an interesting experience. And then the youngest guy, the little guy at this point, was in grade one. He was only six years of age. And I had always thought, well, when you're in grade one, it's the stage when you love school, you love your teacher. Well, I can tell you there wasn't a lot of love happening. Uh, Ian was acting out. He was suspended six times in grade one. And we ended up going through a series of different educational adventures, trying to find the right environment for him in years to come. It would actually take another four years before we got the diagnosis that seemed like the right one for him, which is Asperger's syndrome. And everybody who knows about that now knows it's just an autism spectrum disorder nowadays, but that's what it was called back then. Mm -hmm. So everybody was going through a really hard time. And because the kids were struggling, the parents were struggling, I got really depleted. I gained an extra 100 pounds. It was just a really bad scene. So now let me fast forward to today and just give you a quick snapshot of what's going on with the kids and where they're at. Well, first of all, Julie is in the process of establishing herself as a young artist. She graduated from art college studying photography, and she sees the beauty in broken and abandoned things. And I think that's really significant given her earlier mental health struggles. Mm-hmm. And then there's Scott. Scott, I got a thing. Thank you note from his first employer completely blew my mind after so many years of people not appreciating him. But his employer basically said, thank you for the gift of this young man. He's creative. He's hardworking. He's enthusiastic, etc. And it's just like my jaw dropped. But it was such a Mm. wonderful. Wow. Yes. And then Eric, who I was worried would never ever graduate from high school because of the extent of his learning disability. He not only graduated from high school, he went to um, a community college in Canada and then to study business and then upgraded his skills at the at the um, university level and recently gained certification as a professional chartered accountant. So he's actually working in the accounting field, which completely amazes and impresses me because of his earlier struggles. Mm-hmm. And then there's Ian. Ian, who... You know, the school system was just not designed for Ian. I think the school system had to learn a lot from Ian, (laughs) and it did over the years. And he, last year, completed a year of college and is in the process of establishing himself as an automotive apprentice and just loves that. I think probably if we were back home today, I'd be here hammering in the garage, as I often do, which tells me that Ian's up awake and thriving. Wow. First of all, thank you for sharing all of that. I think so many of us, the Tilt community and myself included, our kids are are earlier on in this journey. And, and a lot of our anxiety or concern comes about just the unknowns of what the future could look like. And it's certainly inspiring to hear what you've been through. And bravo to you, um, for, you for parenting and raising these these unique kids and just to hear what it can look like on the other side. It's super inspiring. So thanks for sharing that. Oh, thank you. Well, okay. Yeah. So as you can, listeners can probably tell, we could talk about so many different things. And um, my hunch is we're going to get feedback and people wanting to know more from you. Um, That would be great. Well, and luckily, Anne has written a book. So and we'll talk about that at the end. And there so she has a lot of wisdom to share with all of us. But we wanted to talk about negative stigmas today and neuro atypical ways of being. And so as a way to get into that conversation, what was your personal experience with negative stigmas? And, you know, when if you can think back of when you were in the thick of it? Yes. How how did the stigmas attach to the di- different diagnoses that your kids were dealing with impacted and affected you as a parent? Well, you know, I think stigma happens on so many different levels. Like I remember the kids saying things that were just so painful to hear as a parent. Like I remember after Ian got his diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome, at one point he would go around saying things like, well, I guess I'm your most defective kid. And it just broke my heart to hear him framing it in that way. And so I think part of it was him sort of trying to figure, feel out like, did I really believe that? And so of course, 
I would just, you know, do what anybody listening to this podcast would do, which is to talk about how our brains are wired differently and how being different is not defective or bad. In fact, it can be a gift in so many ways. And by the time he finished high school, he, he could frame it that way. But during the early years, I think it really was hard for him. And then there was the level of feeling that stigma as a parent and as a member of a family. Like I remember hearing awful things, sometimes secondhand by lovely people who, you know, cared about my family and just said, you know, you need to know people are saying some of this stuff. And one thing I think the worst was when my daughter was having a terrible time with her eating disorder. And we were really, really scared for her having somebody say to somebody else in the community, well, Julie wouldn't have an eating disorder if Anne wasn't so wrapped up in her career. And Mm. I was shocked because People had no way of knowing, like, you know, I had been off work for a month trying to, you know, literally go through the, the, you know, speed dialing every organization that could possibly help my daughter. I couldn't concentrate. I was depressed. You know, I was doing everything I could to help, but you feel so helpless if you're a parent in that situation. Or then I'd hear comments about, you know, how my boys were just, you know, out of control and they just needed more discipline. I mean, that's that's the cure for ADHD. Just be meaner to the kids. And, oh, yeah, that works you know, great. Yeah, we've it's a great plan. It, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but that message came in so many different directions. And even people who were trying to be kind and supportive, sometimes they'd sort of say things that implied that ADHD was just an excuse for bad behavior and so on. And so I got really discouraged. And I think that The only thing that got me through dealing with the stigma was connecting with other parents who'd walked this walk and who could tell me, you know, oh, yeah, people will say things that are completely unreasonable. And then those of us who are living this, we know the truth. And so we can support one another. So I think that's what allowed me to get through that really difficult time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's something we all kind of struggle with. And certainly we can deal with it in different ways, right? So some people, and we'll talk about this a little more, even as parents with differently wired kids can buy into the stigmas or unwittingly feed them a little bit by the way we choose to respond to them. But I, I think that's so interesting how your son, Ian, I believe was, you know, when he made the comment about being the most effective, they, they really do pick up on our cues and how we respond to and perceive and discuss the things that are going on with them really impacts how they see themselves. And even just the way their environment responds to them. Like I remember back when Ian was in grade one and having that really, really difficult year when he was suspended all the time. He told me one day, oh, at lunchtime, I just have to sit in the staff room with all the other bad kids to eat my lunch. Hmm. (sighs) And I thought to see yourself as one of the bad kids when Mm -hmm. you're six years of age, it completely blew my mind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've shared this story on a previous podcast, but I I do remember like picking Asher up in, a, in preschool when he was three. I think he had just turned three and he was starting a new preschool and he was already being labeled by other kids as the bad kid because he was having trouble sitting still in circle time. Can you imagine a three-year-old having trouble sitting still in circle time? Well, and I wasn't he, sitting there just analyzing a spreadsheet like he should have Yeah, been. right. <laughs> but he was a couple times I showed up and he was sitting in a... Um, in like an office by himself, you know, just with the door closed, because he was in trouble. I'm like, okay, my three year old is not in trouble. Like, and and he's no longer going to this school. Thank you very much. But um, (laughs) yeah, and they definitely, they start to own that. It's so true. Okay, so I would like to kind of really get into it. So and I'd like to know your thoughts on why you think there are negative stereo- or stereotypes or stigmas attached to certain diagnoses. And I've also talked about this in another podcast that when we first got the diagnosis of ADHD for Asher, and he has several diagnoses, that's one of them. That was the diagnosis that I was put off by that I really was like, oh, now he doesn't have ADHD. That's a whole other ball of wax. Like he does not have that. I can deal with the Asperger's or I can deal with the other yeah. things. But because I had this stigma, you know, was something that I thought that these kids were out of control. And of course, now I realize that ADHD is a huge part of what's going on with Asher. And I'm also able to see all the gifts that come along with it. But yes. it, it took me a while to get there. And I'm just wondering from, you know, you've done a lot of work in this area and written about this a lot. What are your thoughts about where these stigmas begin and how they're perpetuated? 
Well, it's funny how it almost seems like we have some quote unquote acceptable disorders and some ones that people are still really <laughs> struggling with, right? Yeah, yeah. And I have dealt with this personally. I mean, for years, I talked about the fact that I have depression or I live with depression. But it took until about five years ago that I was able to sort of speak openly and share about the fact that I have a bipolar dis disorder diagnosis as well. It was almost like the world understood depression, but they were frightened by bipolar disorder. And I think there's still that kind of, you know, parting of the ways like, okay, you can have all these things, but these things, mm, I don't know if I can still accept you, which is terrible, because it's an awful message. And, you know, mm -hmm. even just when I was, it was on Twitter, I actually disclosed this, because I felt like if I am having a good life and a happy life and doing well in the world, I think I need to let people know that this is a possibility so that they can see that you can have a mental illness and a great life, you don't have to choose one or the other. Mm -hmm. And that it would be unkind and irresponsible of me to hide that under my coat jacket and sort of say I can't share that part it's too personal so so anyways yeah I have dealt with that but you know I think the price of not talking about these things is so huge I mean when I think of some of the parents I interviewed for for my book some parents were petrified that somebody might figure out that I was talking about their child or their their family and they thought about things like well you know will other family members judge will my child never be able to get a job and like it was a, a, a visceral level of terror which I thought was just so awful that not only are families carrying the you know sometimes the burden of a lot of stress and anxiety and trying to make systems work for their kids and then they can't reach out for the support that would make that easier mm -hmm. because this is this is what happens like first of all parents are less likely to even want to get a diagnosis in the first place because it's like that's too scary what if I don't even want to hear that information and then they can't reach out for support because they feel like somebody will judge them and they can't find the other people who are you know facing this struggle I remember the week after the Canadian edition of my book coming out I got tons of Facebook messages from people in my own life who said oh yeah we were dealing with that too and I was just like smacking my forehead thinking why were we all in silos thinking it was just our family when there are so many families? I mean, statistically, if you look at the numbers everywhere, you know, one in four, one in five, that kind of thing, like that is a huge percentage of people in our neighborhoods who are all having the same struggle. So, mm -hmm. so that's what I think stigma does. It isolates us, it disempowers us, and it makes us feel like we're bad parents raising bad kids, which is not what it's about at all. During this month of planning and organization for big transitions, rhythms and routines have been absolutely essential for our physical and emotional well-being. So Green Chef nights are reliably and predictably a good night. We know the ingredients will be fresh and prepped, the instructions easy to follow, and the meal delicious. We're all still talking about last week's turkey tacos with mango chimichurri sauce, refried beans, and Monterey Jack cheese. Green Chef contributes to a healthy lifestyle with easy and delicious menus like fresh seasonal salads and grain bowls, and with over 80 weekly meal and market options, plus rotating options to suit a variety of lifestyles, whether Mediterranean, plant-based, calorie-smart, keto, protein-packed, gluten-free, there are always plenty of options to choose from. Whatever you select, you'll get farm-fresh ingredients, organic whole fruits and veggies, and premium proteins all delivered straight to your door. I love those four words, straight to my door. Oh, and one more thing I love about Green Chef, they have an app, which means it's easy to manage meal preferences and delivery from your phone if you want to. And I, for one, want to. I am in that mode where I'm making the most of little moments like waiting in line at the pharmacy or for the F train to pull into the station to tackle all of those to-dos. So the convenience of an app is key for me. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash tilt50 and use code tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code tilt50 at greenchef.com slash tilt50. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early, and other times my gambles don't really pay off. Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. 
Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. Absolutely. I I mean, everything you're describing is is one of the biggest reasons why we wanted to create Tilt and really kind of wave our flag and say, hey, you know, we're open about this, we're transparent about this, and there's nothing wrong with it. And, and just trying to empower other parents to speak up as well, because I really do believe that unless we do that, it's, you know, we're going to remain in this, these isolated little boxes, you know, suffering on our own. And, you know, I had the same experience in terms of realizing how much was going on. There was a, a, at one of my son's schools, there was a 2E kind of after school, it wasn't after school, it was like a parent group. We met once a month or something in the library um, to talk about what was going on. And I looked around, and I was like, Oh, my God, you guys are my people. Like, I didn't know they were even there. I didn't know, you know, because it's just not the kind of thing you talk about at pick up after school. So and yeah, we are definitely advocating a model of openness and transparency, both with our kids and with educators and others. And, you know, and that might be our children's friends, parents and, and all of that. There is the issue of taking care of yourself and being selective about who you share information with. I share information with everyone. And for people who listen to the podcast, they know that (laughs) there's very few boundaries in terms of what I will talk about. But, you know, there is a piece of this where you need to at least be aware of who you're speaking to and being thoughtful about how much you want to disclose if you are in a situation that that isn't actually emotionally safe for you. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts about this idea of who and when to share information about what's happening with a child. Right. I think um, probably pretty much on a need to know basis, like the, the classroom teacher would need to know the coach who's helping my kids at some extracurricular activity would need to know. And those relatives who either are directly involved in my child's life or who will be supportive to our family as opposed to judgmental. Because I mean, what you don't want to do is invite a lot of bystanders in who are going to feel like they're helping by sharing some crazy study they found online that has no relevance (laughs) to your situation, or Mm -hmm. the worst parenting strategies known to mankind just because it showed up on their radar screen. So I think it's, it's a case of being selective. And also when you do have those discussions of Thinking about the fact that your child is either going to overhear directly or indirectly what you're saying to these people about them. So, you know, you want to be careful as you choose your words, speak from a position of like your child's strengths and the hope and the optimism and how it's just a case of everybody's trying to figure out the way, the right path or the right way to help your child so that that way it doesn't have to feel like the diagnosis is in any way limiting. It's just a piece of information about your child that you're sharing because it might be helpful to these other people. Right. A couple of things. One, I'm thinking of a conversation I had shortly after I moved here to the Netherlands. I was uh, trying to connect Asher with kids his age and we went on a play date with a mother and her son. I didn't know her very well. But I, you know, again, I'm very just open. Like this is what we're dealing with and this is what's going on. And I don't act ashamed or embarrassed or anything about him, just very matter of fact. But she very matter of factly made it clear that she didn't really believe in (laughs) really any of the diagnoses that that, you know, (laughs) that's an American thing to do all these diagnoses. And everyone, every child is uniquely why like that kind of conversation. I was like, hmm, 
<laughs> okay, so this is not my person. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to be having long conversations about this. And so I think I've I've also, again, I will share what's going on, but I'm very quick to draw boundaries uh, in terms of how deep a relationship will go or, and also making sure that I don't take on that person's energy or thinking, let it influence how I'm feeling about something. Absolutely. That makes so much sense. So I'm curious about talking about your, the diagnoses with your children. So you know, we've always been super open with Asher about what we've discovered about the way he's wired. And it's something that comes up in the Tilt uh, Facebook page or that I get feedback, sometimes private feedback from parents who, you know, they haven't shared the diagnosis with the child yet, or they've only told them some of it, and they're concerned about their self esteem, etc. So could you right. let us know how you handled that issue of disclosing a diagnosis with your kids? And when did you do that if you did it? Well, we did it with everybody right along the way as we got the information. Now, bear in mind that all of our diagnoses came sort of, I'd say, sometime after age six and then running through until age 27. One of our kids was very late getting her final diagnosis. So yeah, quite a gamut of ages. But we weren't talking about toddlers or preschoolers where we might have a hard time conveying the concepts. These were kids who, you know, these were just things we always talked about as a family. We're a fairly open family. But I think the big thing was when I was grappling with this is, um, what if I don't tell my child? What is he going to be trying to, to think about himself in order to make sense of his world? And this was really reinforced for me when I was researching my book, because a couple of the adults that I interviewed said that they didn't know what they were dealing with growing up, but they knew that something was wrong. And they didn't know what it was. And because they didn't know what it was, they didn't know what to do differently or how to get help and so on. So I sort of approached it from that point of view of how awful it would feel to be that child who's getting subtle and not so subtle feedback from adults that there's a problem and they just don't know how to manage that. So at least if you have the piece of information about yourself, like the fact that I know I live with bipolar disorder, I can use that to inform my decisions. I know that sleep is not a luxury for me. I have to make sleep a priority or I get way out of whack. I have to walk every day. So I have specific strategies, just as any child will, once they know, like, okay, this is the way my brain works. If this starts to happen, I do that, you know, that kind of thing. They figure out their personal solutions. But I think at the same time, you also have to be honest with your child about the fact that some people still don't get it. And some people will say hurtful or unhelpful or just plain stupid things. And so they should bring those things home and you can talk through it as a family. You can talk about why would somebody say something like that to somebody else? What does that say about the person? What does that say about their worldview? And what do we really know about this situation? Because you don't want your child to to start feeling like they're quote unquote defective. You don't want them to start feeling like they have to solve all these problems on their own. This is why we are part of families, because then we have that support network of people who love and appreciate and care about us. That's great. I was going to ask you that question specifically about you know, it's one thing to tell a child about their diagnosis, but it's another to kind of then take it a step further and let them know that not everyone is going to see this as an awesome thing. Right. You know, with Asher, he identified himself as having ADHD before we even really knew it. I think we had a provisional diagnosis at the time when he was maybe six or something. And we we're reading a book together and one of the characters had ADHD and he asked me what it was because it actually the the label came up in the text and I explained to him what it was. And he, and he just paused and he looked at me and said, do I have that? And I said, <laughs> well, that is one of the things we think may be going on with you. Why do you recognize yourself in this? And he said, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. And then, you know, we told him about uh, his Asperger's when he right after we got the diagnosis, and I think he was eight, um, coming up on nine. And it was an empowering thing for him. And it kind of made him feel, as you said, this piece of information that explained a lot about why he was the way he was. And he kind of sees it as a superpower in some ways. Yes. But it is trickier discussing the fact because he's such a confident person and feels really just good about who he is and his uniqueness. And it has been difficult or maybe painful is too strong of a word, but it's it's a hard thing to let your kids know that some people are going to 
perceive you differently, are going to treat you like you're or look at you like you're strange sometimes, like they're not going to get you. Yes. I remember one time we were having a picnic in the park and I had read an article. It was a research article about a relationship between a certain medication and a higher rate of autism in children. And I I was telling my husband about it and Asher was like, what are you talking about? And we kind of are very open. So I told him, explained it. And I said, yeah, and according to this research, the risks of having a child with autism. And he said, what do you mean the risks? Yeah. And I was like, I love that. Good point. Yeah. Yes. It's funny because you're making me think back to the time when we told Ian about his Asperger's. And of course, we did a lot of, you know, hand wringing and soul searching and so on. And he was going through this stage where he would go to bed and then um, sometimes he would just write us a note and throw it down the stairs like an airplane as opposed to coming down to talk to us. <laughs> so we got this like Ianogram waiting at the bottom of the stairs and I opened it up and this was after we told about Asperger's and he said, I just want you to know I am okay with the diagnosis. I just don't like the name Asperger's. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I love that. I love that he <laughs> sent you airplane notes. That's classic. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to just spend a moment talking about how we can, as parents and empower our kids to kind of do our job in getting rid of these stigmas. Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken, and we have totally got this. The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. I hope to see you on the inside. If you're a parent, I invite you to join us at the Mindful Mama podcast, where it's all about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. With sometimes hilarious and always thought-provoking experts and friends, at Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and I can't wait to see you there. Listen in to the Mindful Mama podcast. I wanted to just mention this fantastic US-based national organization called Eye to Eye. I'm not sure if you're if you've heard no, of that. But I'd love to hear about it. It was founded by David Flink, who actually Asher is going to be interviewing for the podcast cool. coming up. He's the author of a book called Thinking Different. And Eye to Eye pairs younger students with older students who have the same diagnosis of either a learning or an attention issue or both, such as ADHD, dyslexia, mm -hmm. and so on. But one of the things that I love about the model is that they promote not only the openness of what's going on, but they really encourage kids to just own what's going on. Like they have these awesome t-shirts on the website that say things like ADHD proud to be, or this is what ADHD looks like. This is what dyslexia yeah. looks like. And they're really coolly designed. Like it's, it's like, Hey, we got to own this stuff and, and feel good about it. So I think that's one great example, but do you have any other thoughts about how we as parents and how our kids can play a role in shattering the negative stigmas associated with what's going on with them? I think if they can think about some of the upsides of this way of thinking, like, 
I mean, I'm a very creative person. And if I didn't have a bipolar type brain, or, you know, for my, my son, who's the software developer, if he didn't have an ADHD kind of brain, um, you would never put together completely unrelated ideas in the universe and say, well, wow, if I put this and this and stir twice, look at what I get. <laughs> it's that kind of like, free range brain out there in the world that will find one random fact and bring it home and connect it with something you remember from last week. So, that, so that's how creativity and insightful thinking happens. So we often talk about that as a family because all four kids have the ADHD diagnoses. And I'm sure my husband just, you know, fell under the radar screen because he's <laughs> definitely a role model in that area in our family. And, you know, just about how wouldn't it be boring to just, you know, go through a predictable day knowing that you were going to do these tasks and that's how it would turn out as opposed to, wow, let's do a U-turn here and let's try crossing the street there. And, you know, so we're just mm -hmm. that family. I'm sure we exhaust people who are guests at our dinner table. I think <laughs> I almost feel like we should provide them with pillows and a blanket in case they <laughs> need to take a break. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I think owning those gifts and, and the self-knowledge piece is really huge, for sure. I mean, I think that is what I spent a lot of time with Asher. In fact, the, uh, uh, we did an episode on mindset, which is just about... I love that. Yeah, growth mindset, fixed mindset. Yes. Asher's like total brain science geek, and he's all over figuring out how he ticks and what what's going to support him and um, being the best that he can be. Mm -hmm. knowing what's going on and also making sure the world can see how cool it can be to have these different wirings going on. Right. And I think having a sense of humor too, because there are times when, you know, like Ian will get really into sort of, you know, the, the narrow channel thinking about something and getting a little bit obsessed and stuff. And we can usually joke him out of it if he's getting a little mm -hmm. bit, you know, over, over the edge on things and so on. And then he'll laugh with us because he can sort of say, oh yeah, I might've been being a little bit rigid in that. I can yep. see that now. And, and, but you know, me, like we went out for this family dinner uh, on Mother's Day and it took too long to get our dinner and I was starving and I was like for me if I get too hungry or too tired like the mood swings start so they're saying are you okay it's like I'm sitting there crying at the table I just said I'm gonna be fine as long as somebody brings me protein quickly or else this is not gonna end well so <laughs> Just being really frank and explicit about your needs. And then yep. I'm sure they're like, waiter, this is an emergency. Bring this woman in now. <laughs> Sounds like a sitcom. Yes. Sometimes <laughs> it feels like I'm living in one. Although it's much better than like the horror docudrama of 10 years ago. So Yeah, I'm sure. I can only imagine. I mean, I have one child and... I know with those early years, you know, he just turned 12 and we're in such a different space already. I can almost... I can almost like forget how bad things were at a certain point in time. Um, but I have plenty of documentation <laughs> in my <laughs> journals and emails. Them, yeah, <laughs> Exactly. Well, listen, before we go, I would love to hear more about your book. I mentioned earlier, Parenting Through the Storm. It came out in Canada in 2015, but the U.S. versions just came out last week. So can you tell us a little bit about that book and what parents can expect to get from it? Absolutely. It's based on interviews with 50 other parents who've had a really hard time with, you know, with something going on in their family, some kind of difference. So I think that what I wanted to do was to take that hard earned wisdom that we learn along the way, and to try and pull that together in a book that would be supportive. So it's, it's everything from, you know, how does having a child who is struggling in some way impact on the family? And how do you deal with these things as a parent? And then practical things like navigating the process of getting a diagnosis, making sense of that, finding the right treatment plan, thinking critically about the treatment plan, because sometimes the diagnosis or the treatment plan doesn't make sense. And you have to say, wait a minute, I think you're describing someone else's child. And then advocating for your child, teaching your child how to be a strong advocate, connecting with other parents who truly get it so you can put together your own parenting village, like what you were saying earlier, Debbie, about finding your people, mm -hmm. finding those people and celebrating them. And then 
looking forward to a day when hopefully things will be better and how to sort of carve out the path to get there. It could be things like, you know, parenting strategies that bring out the best and not the worst in your child and self-care for yourself. As I learned along the way, you know, self-care is not just something you do when you have time. It's something you have to do consistently. It took Mm -hmm. me a long time to figure that out. Maybe I can shorten somebody else's learning curve. And speaking honestly and frankly, I think every time I get to the final chapter of the book, because as you know, as an author, when you're the author, you get to read your book 10,000 million times before publication <laughs> as you proofread the pages and so on. Every time I get to the final stories of hope and wisdom and compassion and acceptance and love from the families, I always end up crying because it's like that is all I ever wanted was for my children to be happy and healthy. And that's what all parents want is for their children to be happy and healthy. And so many families have found their own way to that place. Thank you for going through all of that. It is so comprehensive, everything that you've included in the book, it really feels to me like a a handbook, really to surviving, you know, all the different aspects of raising a differently wired kid. So congratulations on the book. And I hope that listeners go out and will definitely benefit from from getting that. Thank you. And so I have one last question. Where can parents connect with you online? What's the best place to get in touch with you? My website, which is Ann Douglas, A N N D O U G L A S dot net. And they'll find I have like a directory of resources and uh, some articles, blog, you know, all the usual suspects will be found on my website. And of course, I love getting mail. So just click on the content or contact link and send me a note. I'd love to hear from you. Awesome. And I will include links to Anne's books and website and everything else we discussed in this conversation in the show notes. So Anne, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and talking with us about stigmas today and and your experience and your journey. I think this is such a critical piece of the conversation that we have to, we just have to keep having it if we're going to shift the way our children experience school and life and the way we as parents experience raising them. So thanks so much for being a part of it. Thank you. And thank you for creating such a brilliant podcast. As I told you before, you were number one on my people I wanted to be interviewed list. So you actually were the first person to do my interview for the international edition of my book. And I couldn't be more excited, Debbie. Awesome. Thank you for the honor. That's very cool. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. To learn more about Anne Douglas and her book, Parenting Through the Storm, and the other resources mentioned in our conversation, visit the show notes at tiltparenting.com slash session 28. If you like this episode and you're new to the Tilt Parenting Podcast, don't forget to check out all our episodes on tiltparenting.com slash podcast. And we have a lot of great episodes coming up, including an interview with Eye to Eye founder David Flink, author of the new book, The Pie Life, Samantha Edis, and writer Therese Gray. And of course, the special Asher episodes every third week. So if you haven't subscribed yet, we encourage you to do so on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, or Podbean. Thanks again for listening. For more information on Tilt Parenting, visit www.tiltparenting.com. Are you overwhelmed by the things that get in the way of you doing what you want to do? Are you looking for ways to simplify life to better align with your values? Do you want to create space in your schedule so you have room for more of the good stuff? Play, joy, relationships, gratitude, and more? If you answered yes to any of these questions, I invite you to check out Edit Your Life, a podcast to help you edit the unnecessary from your life so you have more room to enjoy the awesome. Through episodes with me, Christine Ko, and a range of super smart, compassionate, and thoughtful guests, you'll come away with big picture insights and practical ways to declutter your home, schedule, and mental space without getting bogged down by perfection. I have always believed that small moments and actions matter tremendously. My goal is to help you find agency and space in your life through doable baby steps that will leave you feeling accomplished instead of overwhelmed. Check out Edit Your Life wherever you enjoy your podcasts.